everyone, Dave here, Fit and Healthy Forever. Uh, before I start today's video, I just wanted to give a shameless plug to my new t-shirts with the logo on. I've had these printed and uh, I'm really pleased with them. They're embroidered on, not printed actually. So, uh, really pleased with them. So, today's video. Um, I'm going to talk about insulin. Now, I think it's important that we understand insulin a bit better. Um, I'm sure there's some of you out there who understand it quite well if you if you deal with people who are diabetic or if you're diabetic yourself. Um, I did some research on this because it's important when you're trying to maintain your weight or lose weight that you understand how insulin works. So I'm, I've tried to keep it as basic as I can. I understand it better myself now. I understood it a little bit, but I understand it much better now. So first of all, uh, what is insulin? It's a hormone, it's made and secreted by the pancreas, which is a, a gland that's underneath the left side of your rib cage. Okay. Uh, hormones are what they call communication particles that travel through the blood. And the main purpose of insulin is to lower blood sugar. So usually you would, you would have just a teaspoon of sugar in, in all of your body as a general rule. The average person has about one and a half gallons of blood in their body. So any more than a teaspoon of sugar within that um, 12, 12 pints or one and a half gallons, then your body has to get rid of it out of the bloodstream because your body tries to maintain a level of insulin and in, in, of um, blood glucose. So the average person today is taking in roughly about 31 uh, teaspoons of sugar. And you've only got, or you only need half a teaspoon in your body at any one time. So that's a lot of sugar. You have to bear in mind, I'm talking sugar coming from any sort of carbohydrates, whether it be cakes, biscuits, rice, pasta, um, potatoes, breads, anything like that. It's all converted into glycogen or a type of sugar that your body uses for energy. I'll go through that a bit more in a minute. Insulin allows cells to absorb glucose, a bit like when the, when the glucose is trying to get into your cells, insulin is like a key that opens the door and lets it in to, to, do its, to do its job. So it stores sugar in the liver and muscles as well in the form of glycogen, which can be released if you want a quick burst of energy anytime. So it's absorbed, as I say, into cells and into liver and muscles. That's the main three areas you would find it. Any amount of sugar over and above what your body needs, so it'll need so much um, for your cells, it'll need so much to put into your liver and muscles, your body to function. Anything over and above that, your body will store as fat. Make no mistake, it will store it as fat. Sugar or carbohydrate is just an energy source, so your body will take what it needs and what it doesn't need. Insulin's job is then, once you put it into uh, liver, muscles and cells is to put what's left over into fat storage. So please take that on board because that's where people are making a huge mistake I think with carbohydrates. They're not realising that once your body's taken what it needs the rest will be stored as fat. So by saying that then insulin is also a fat storage hormone. So it's got several jobs that it does. It also helps with the absorption of amino acids, which are building blocks for protein and muscle, and also helps with the absorption of potassium. Now, if you watched my one of my recent videos on salt, you need a lot of potassium in your body, and it's, it's difficult to get it. And this is, um, it helps the absorption, uh, insulin does, of potassium in your body. So it, potassium works in conjunction with salt, and it's, it's sort of helped with absorption with insulin. Um, it's also um, insulin, it blocks fat burning and it retains sodium. So if you're looking to burn fat, too much insulin spiking in your body will blunt the fat storing uh, process, uh, fat, fat burning process. So um, again, bear that in mind. I think people think when they're trying to lose weight, it's just a case of calories in, calories out. That is a basic synopsis of how it works, but it goes a bit deeper than that. 
you can just work on that premise and then find out that you're just not losing weight or you're not losing body fat. There's a difference between losing weight and losing body fat. Get that into your heads because losing weight, you can lose fluid, muscle tissue, which you don't want to lose either of, and a minimum amount of fat. Unless you, if you're controlling insulin and the way you eat carbs and sugars, you will burn predominantly fat. So again, think about that. There's a thing called insulin resistance. Now, if you're insulin resistant, this could mean that you're pre-diabetic or you are actually a diabetic. Now, insulin is dysfunctional in this case and it can't get into the cells to perform its job. When I've just said to you, insulin um, pushes the, the sugars and that into cells, it, when insulin is released, if you're insulin resistant, which means you've just taken an excessive amount of, of glucose or sugar or carbs over a long period of time, insulin can't do its job properly so you become insulin resistant and it doesn't allow the cells to to be opened up for the absorption of the of the sugars and the glucose therefore your body just sends signals back to your brain to release more um, insulin it keeps releasing insulin but you've got so much insulin floating around in your blood because it can't do its job if you're insulin resistant so then you become pre or full diabetic so if insulin is blocked like this you end up with higher blood levels blood sugar levels which are out of control but the cells are actually starved of insulin and glucose you will then start to crave sugars okay that's a sidebar of it this is insulin resistance and can cause more fat conversion especially around the abdominal area so you'll notice diabetics usually uh, carry a lot of weight around the midsection it's a sort of if you, if you want it, for better, want of a better phrase, like a byproduct of being diabetic. It can also starve the brain, of, brain cells of glucose, leading to memory loss. So that's another side effect of insulin resistance. Also, you would be unable to absorb amino acids, which would lead to muscle and strength loss. So if you're training hard and you're trying to, to build muscle, this is going to stop you if you, if you become insulin resistant. And there's not really, initially, it, it, you won't see symptoms of it until it's well advanced, until you're almost diabetic before you, you can notice symptoms of it. So what stimulates insulin? Sugars, basically, in the form of carbohydrates. So I want you to understand that when I'm talking sugars, I'm not talking just table sugars. I'm talking all sorts of carbohydrates are broken down in the body as sugars and glycogen and used for energy. That's the basic um, action that, that carbohydrates do. They're just an energy source. So they're broken down in your body as sugar or glycogen and used as energy. And as I said earlier, once your body's taken what it needs, the rest will be stored as fat. You must understand that because this is where I believe a lot of people are going wrong. Also, if you combine sugar with protein, you'll get an exaggerated insulin spike, um, even more than uh, sugars on it on their own. So although protein is needed to build muscle, I think, and I've done this in the past, I've eaten excessive amounts of protein thinking I'd rather eat a bit more than not enough to make sure I'm building muscle. You're just causing insulin spikes and you see, you, you'll excrete a lot of it anyway if you, if you have too much. Your body doesn't need half as much as you think. The maximum your body would need to build muscle is at one gram per pound of body weight, unless you're classed as what's called a real hard gainer, and then you may need anything up to one and a half grams. An elite athlete or a hard gainer would need up to one and a half grams per pound of lean body weight. So I, I take in roughly about three quarters of a gram per pound of body weight, roughly so, about 150 grams for me. Um, and I'm 180, just over 180 pounds. So also, um, excessive protein on its own stimulates it and monosodium gluconate will spike insulin by up to 300%. Now, if you watch my video on salt, monosodium gluconate is, is what, when, when manufacturers say they've lowered the salt in their products, so you're okay to buy them sort of thing, they put in monosodium gluconate in place of it, which has been linked to various diseases. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember them all. But if you watch the, the video on salt, it, I, I'll go into a little bit more detail there. 
it's just another additive that people add in to say, oh, we've lowered the salt in this, but they don't tell you they've put monosodium gluconate in instead, which is far worse probably than the, the original amount of salt. So, in fact, every time you eat something, any type of food, you will spike insulin to an extent, but more so with certain foods, very sugary foods. Even fruits, fruits that are very sugary, bananas for instance, they will spike insulin. Whereas because an apple or a pear or an orange has got a bit more fiber in it, it would, it would spike insulin a lot less. So you have to look at the, there's a book or a table called the glycemic index. I've mentioned this in my, in my carbohydrate video. You can get it online and you can look at the glycemic index of certain foods. And the higher the index, it goes from 1 to 100, table sugar being 100. The higher the, the, the score up to 100, the more it spikes your insulin. So you're looking for foods that are well below 50 in the 20s, 30s. They will spike your insulin a lot less. So that's one way of, of determining what sort of foods uh, are good and what aren't. So your body's always working to maintain the balance. And I'll go through what the, the normal range and the normal balance is in a minute. So having said all that, this is why when I've done the videos, intermittent fasting is so beneficial, not just for the health benefits of it. If you do intermittent fasting with um, ketogenic diet, which is so tough, don't get me wrong, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you it's easy. I've done it now for probably close on 18 months. It is very tough at first. You've got to be creative with your food. You've got to be very sort of strict um, but that is the way that you'll get the most benefits for your health. You're not going to spike insulin very, very rarely. You're going to spike it to any level because you're not eating carbohydrates at all with ketogenic. Your carbs are below 50 grams a day and most of them come from salads and veg. So you're eating virtually zero sugars. My net carbs are below 30 grams a day. Now your net carbs are your total carbs less the fiber. That's the net amount of carbs that are going into your system because fiber doesn't get digested. So if you take a carbohydrate source that's got, say, the, the portion you're having, say, has got 30 grams of carbohydrate, but um, 15 of them are fi fiber, then only 15 grams are actual carbs, net carbs they're called. So bear that in mind as well. This is why intermittent fasting is so beneficial. It's about the frequency of eating as well. So you're eating, I'm eating three meals a day over eight hours and then the other 16 hours I'm fasting. And it's so, so easy. I've got seven or eight friends on it now and every single one, friends and family, every single one is not only losing weight but they're losing inches. Because they're training as well, the, the body shape's changing. They're finding they might only lose one or two pounds but they're dropping two dress sizes or two sizes in jeans. But they're maintaining muscle as well. It's, it's phenomenal that you've got to see these results to believe them. But please think about this because if you can do just intermittent fasting, you'll get massive, massive benefits. If you can do both together, wow, honestly, my strength goes through the roof. I'm, I'm lighter than I've been since I was a teenager now at 13 stone, but I'm still squatting 315 pounds. I'm still deadlifting similar sort of weight. Um, I'm, I'm not a million miles away from my best ever maximums a two and a half stone lighter than I've ever been. It's, it's phenomenal. So, also, cortisol, a stress hormone, will also trigger insulin. So you need to manage, your, everyone has stress in their lives, you just need to manage your stress levels as best you can. You can't ever get rid of it. We've all got stress of some sort. Um, it could be your job, it could be your family, it could be um, a number of things, an illness or whatever. But you have to manage it as best you can. And I found one of the ways I can do it is, I don't know how you do it, I can't tell you how to do it, but I find that I don't let things get to me like they used to. I could be very highly strung at, at, at one time. Um, some, just something as silly as the dog's doing something daft and I'd just go off, off on one. I'm not like that anymore. I'm so chill because my life is so good. Um, I, I don't think my life could get much better. More money wouldn't make me any happier than I am now, so that, that's, that's me. Also, excessive nicotine and caffeine affects insulin as well. 
Now, what can inhibit insulin? Fasting. So intermittent fasting. When you're fasting for the 16 hours that I am, you're not spiking any insulin because you're not eating anything. It takes between seven and nine hours for your body to digest and get rid of all the food in your system. For the other six, seven, eight hours, whatever it may be, up to 16 hours fasting, you are actually burning fat, either the ingested fat that you've taken in or the fat that your body carries. So again, that's one of the reasons I'm leaner now than I've ever been, because I've been doing this for quite some time now and it's the best thing I've ever done. And as I say, I've got friends, there's seven or eight friends and family that are on this and not one of them wants to come off it. And some of them I've had a job to persuade them to just give it a try, give it a few weeks and see. And I know one guy in the first five weeks uh, lost 13 pounds, but he's dropping, he's not dropping any strength. He's, he's a, a big guy, a uh, very strong, very powerful guy in the gym. And I keep asking him, how's your strength? Is your strength dropped? No. He says, I'm, as it was before, still pushing the same weights, but he's lost a stone. Now, normally you would say mass push, pushes mass. So you see uh, power lifters or strong men, they're so big because that mass pushes mass. But we're finding now, not to the level that they are, but we're finding now when we're doing intermittent fasting that your strength's not going down that much. So massive bonus. Cutting out sugars and carbs, which is basically ketogenic diet, also inhibits insulin release. Apple cider vinegar. Now this is, I'm going to do a separate video on this because I think it's worth it. It negates insulin release. Now, it, there's a few, few benefits to apple cider vinegar. It's not the best tasting. I use a pint of water, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and a tablespoon of lemon juice, pure lemon juice, not some sort of cordial. Now, it has major benefits. It doesn't spike insulin. Uh, it also uh, helps to detox your liver. So I'll go through this in a separate video, but again, that, that helps to negate insulin secretion. So if you're doing intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet, it's 100% effective. And it's tough, but you will never look back. I promise you, you won't look back. Anybody who can't do this or can't stick to intermittent fasting, to me, you just, I'm trying to put it as polite as I can, but you, to me, you just don't value your health. You just don't value your health because it's so easy once you get into it to stick to. You know, with intermittent fasting, have a look at the video because you're not restricting calories. You're restricting the window that you eat in. So if you do a 16-8 where you eat for eight hours and and fast for 16, in that eight hours, you can virtually eat what you want within reason. Obviously, if your diet's clean, you'll get better results. But within reason, you can eat what you want in that, them eight hours. I haven't cut calories at all. I can still eat 3,000 calories a day in that time and still lose weight. Crazy, but try it, honestly. So, if we move on to normal ranges of, of blood, blood sugars. Normal range of blood sugars, I've made notes here to sort of look for this. For healthy individuals, they have four to six minimoles per litre. So that's four to six minimoles of uh, blood sugars to every litre of blood. Or the other range looking at is 72 to 108 milligrams per deciliter of blood when fasted. Now, this, I've been used, more used to the 72 to 108. Your body likes to keep that as a... As a um, as a sort of normal range so when you eat food your blood sugars will probably go up above the 108 that's when your body will secrete insulin which will lower it back down okay if you go below 72 you would crave something to eat yogurt so you'd have something to eat and it would go up and your body tries to maintain this balance between 72 and 108 but it's difficult if you're not helping it you need to help your body to do this. Um, as I've said before, your body is 100% able to um, maintain itself, heal itself. You have to give it the raw materials. You can't expect a car to perform if you don't put petrol in it and you don't have it serviced regularly and look after it. It's the same with your body. Look after it, give it the right fuel. It'll maintain and look after itself. It's not difficult. If you get levels, 
between 100 and 125, they're classed as pre-diabetic. So where your body tries to maintain a 72 to 108 range, if it goes above 108, it will secrete insulin and lower it back down. If you're get, getting towards insulin resistant, where your insulin's not doing what it's supposed to do, you will go up towards the 125 mark and you'll be um, pre-diabetic. You can change this, but you would need to change your diet drastically. So to prevent you getting there, do something now. Typical symptoms of high blood glucose appear more often when levels are higher than 250 milligrams per deciliter. That is extremely high. If you think the range between 72 and 108, you won't see symptoms usually till they're above 250. To me, that's getting serious. So it's basically saying that until it gets to serious levels in your bloodstream, you're not going to see any symptoms. So this is going to creep up on you. Now, there are ways you can buy monitors and whatever else to, to check your insulin. But if you just look after your diet, you won't need to do all that. If you're curious and you want to buy one or you want to get it done, I don't know if your doctor would do it, and just check on it now and then see where you go from there, fine. But if you get your diet in order, you probably wouldn't need to be checking it all the time. But if you're not, and your diet's out of order, it is creeping up on you. Believe me, it's creeping up on you. So under 100 milligrams per deciliter are considered normal. So that's all on insulin. I hope that's a bit more understandable. When I've researched it and I've sort of tried to break it down a bit, I can fully understand this, but it's easier when you've researched it to say, yes, I understand that. I hope it helps. If not, please feel free to message me. Um, I'll, I'll get, try and get the answers for you if I don't know them off the top of my head. Please, please, please have a look at intermittent fasting. If you feel like you can do both, try keto as well. If you do intermittent fasting first for a few weeks, it's much easier to, to transition over to keto. I've always suggested keto is better for if you've got a target to aim for a wedding a holiday um, a party anything like that it's difficult to maintain it indefinitely i'm probably i don't know whether you'd call it anal or whatever but to me my health matters 100 percent to me and i'll do whatever it takes to keep myself healthy and if that means going on keto indefinitely that's what i'll do and i'll put myself out to do it and I think people should look at it like that because when we've said, you know, it creeps up on you, things like this um, insulin resistance, all of a sudden one day you're going to be there and then you're going to say, God, I could have done something about this. And that's the way I look at things. I don't want things to creep up on me and then say, if I'd have done this, I could have probably prevented this from happening. You don't want to go through life wishing you'd done it. Do it now. Please do it now. Okay, thanks everyone for listening. As always, stay fit and healthy forever. If you like what I'm putting out, like, subscribe. Any suggestions you want, if I can cover it in a video, I will do. But until the next video, stay fit and healthy forever. Thank you.